Adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, and trauma-informed practice are becoming buzzwords regardless of the organisation you happen to work for. If you've not heard of them yet, you soon will. But what's it all about and what's it got to do with you lot? Well, an adverse childhood experience is an experience that happens during childhood that could be said to be, uh, be, said to be traumatic. So clearly, any form of abuse would be classed as an ACE. But more than that, we're talking about experiences where the physical and emotional needs of a young person are consistently not being met. So things like neglect or parental substance abuse or even um, parental illness and extreme poverty would be classed as an adverse childhood experience. But so what? Don't look back. You're not going that way. Shouldn't we just be looking forward? Well, it's very easy to say until we realise the time at which the brain, at these experiences are happening is the time at which the brain is developing. And therefore, these experiences have a long-lasting impact on the person, um, on the way their brain develops, on the way they see themselves, and on the way they perceive the world around them. In effect, they create what I call their default setting. And I'd like to explain to you what I mean by that. I know I hate me. Too loud, too brash with a mouth that won't shush. Shut up, you stupid cow. No one's interested in your pointless stuff. Too arrogant, too rude, too desperate to prove. Pfft, never amount to anything. Too thick to improve. I know I hate me. Always on the outside, never truly belonging. Get up to your room, not welcome, stop stalling, not good enough, don't deserve, a total waste of space. Too greedy, too selfish, bloody disgrace. I know I hate me. Desperate to be alone, to stop people getting too close. Who'd want to be friends with someone so gross? Who'd want to lie next to your ugly face? Can't even look at you to think the words rape. I know I hate me. Too compliant to fight, just praying you won't appear. Lying silent in the dark, immobilised by fear. Doing as instructed. Pff, won't pay to make you angry. Instead of responding, I just stare at you blankly. You see, I know I hate me. I even know the reason. Hating is safe. It protects what's inside. It keeps closed the barrier. All feelings have died. Too dangerous to trust. Won't ever win. Better off alone than to let the wolves in. And I know the real me remains locked up and hurt. And I know that she's waiting, needing love to reverse past damage that was done. Bring to the here, to the now. I know I need change. What I don't know is how. OK, so the last part of that is not strictly true anymore. I do know parts of how. And the part of how that we're looking at today is the part that's got to do with you. And in order to do that, we're going to be looking at Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory. Now, in order to understand this, we need to be able to understand three parts of the brain. The prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking brain, our limbic system, which is our survival and our emotional brain, and the brainstem, which is how our brain links to the rest, um, to the rest of our body. Now, Porges argues that the untraumatised brain is linked to our vital survival organs, our heart, our lungs, our stomach and digestive system, through the ventral vagal complex. And what that means, simply, is that so long as there's no sense of threat or danger, that our breathing and our heart rates works as they should do, everything's normal, everything's fine. Now, when danger does present itself, it's our limbic system that notices first, and specifically our amygdala, which is the smoke alarm of our brain. It warns of potential danger. And the, um, the message is sent to the frontal brain um, to look for the danger. Messages are then sent back um, telling us whether, you know, we need to be worried or not. At which point, if we do, we enter our autonomic nervous system. 
And what that means is that our body gets ready to fight or flight the danger. So our heart rate and our breathing speeds up. Access to our stomach is, is cut off. We feel sick. Um, and that comes from when we were cavemen. And, you know, the danger was potentially a saber-toothed tiger, for example. And they needed to fight or run away from it in order to survive. That hasn't changed. So we will deal with whatever the danger is, and then we will return to our ventral vagal complex. Everything will go back to as it was. But for the traumatized brain, things don't work that way. And when we think to the past, we understand why. A child who is being brought up in traumatic circumstances live very much in their limbic system. Okay, their amygdala is constantly firing because they are constantly in danger, sometimes in danger of their lives. It is life-threatening. And therefore, the limbic system becomes swollen and the amygdala becomes overactive, which means that also the, the pathways that should develop to the um, frontal brain during our, our ch childhood and during teenage years don't develop as they should, which means as adults, we, ha we are stuck within the limbic system. And what that means is that when we're triggered, our brain, our amygdala, sort of says, danger, 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 and it doesn't stop. It doesn't recognise that that danger was years ago and has long since passed. It keeps telling us that there's, there's something to be afraid of. And I want you to think about what that feels like. Imagine a deep and searing pain, no mark to act as proof, no swelling or temperature or sickness or heat, no sign of any kind. Fraud. Inside, the pain is constant, but it's one that cannot be described. Nails scratching across an everlasting board, the incessant screeching of a wheel, a tap dripping into an empty pot, drip, drip, drip unrelenting, all played out together as the vice-like grip on the exhausted brain gets tighter, scratch, and tighter, screech, and tighter, drip, unceasing, scratch, unremitting, screech, unending, drip. Disjointed thoughts, scratch, screech, invade the mind, march roughshod over all original thoughts, screech, stirring up memories, doubt, useless, helpless, pathetic, as the vice gets tighter, scratch, screech, drip at a tighter, pathetic, a boa constrictor, useless, suffocates the chest, scratch, screech, drip, gets tighter, useless, can't breathe, feel sick, pathetic, the silver point, helpless of a hard cold blade, Pathetic. Presses deep <gasps> into soft, relenting flesh. Silence. Blood trickles across clammy skin. It's okay. It's okay to breathe again. Okay, so we can see how unhelpful coping strategies such as self-harm can develop when that experience is so distressing. But the brain has a flip side to hypervigilance. And you will notice if someone's within this state because very often they talk quite fast, they move around quite a lot, they might be very guarded, they might uh, be quite aggressive, or they might sweat a lot. Okay? And so we might notice this, but there's a flip side, which is dissociation. And the signs of dissociation is when someone is staring into space for a prolonged period of time, away with the fairies, you might say. And the reason for that is that, basically, their brain is cut off. As a child, you can't fight or flight the circumstances you are in. You are fighting adults in an adult world, and therefore the brain protects itself by shutting down, which is really, really helpful at the time, but the brain continues to use that strategy as an adult, which is really unhelpful. Okay? A glass wall surrounds me, trapped in a vacuum of nothingness. The daily actions continue as before, but they are nothing. They mean nothing. The actions, robotic. Feelings, elusive. I have become a mannequin, an empty vessel who no one sees or regards a blank face in a nameless crowd of no more significance than yesterday's torn up newspaper floating on the wind. Redundant. If I sit still enough, 
Maybe I'll become a statue. Maybe I'll fade away. Maybe I'll become nothing. Okay, so you get my point, clearly. Okay, adverse childhood experiences have a lasting impact. But so what? What's it got to do with you? Not your problem, right? You can't change the past. What are you supposed to do about it? Now, the thing is, is that ACEs, you know, understandably lead to mental illness. And mental illness is uh, something that is protected under the Equality Act. Um, and therefore, organisations, regardless of what you are, have a duty, a legal duty, to make reasonable adjust adjustments. But, you might say, how am I supposed to know? People don't go around talking about, you know, past abuse or about mental illness even. Very few people could disclose it. And you're right, they don't, because it's still taboo. The reason why I choose to talk about it. But there's the signs that I've already mentioned that you might notice. And the suggestions I'm going to make are ones that will benefit all members of your organisation, be it you know, schools, health organisations, businesses, whatever. Okay? Not just those who happen to have a traumatic past. So what's it all about then? What we need to realise is that um, a child being brought up in traumatic circumstances does not feel safe. They have, they have no sense of safety. And therefore, unsafe situations are triggering, extremely triggering. So we need to make our, our workplaces safe. So how do we do that? First of all, relationships. Absolutely vital. Okay? We need to be able to... Um, we treat everybody within that organisation, be it pupils, be it staff of any status, or patients, whoever, with unconditional positive regard. Talk to them, learn people's names, ask, how was your weekend? What did you get up with? Be genuine, be honest, okay? Um, if we're talking about um, schools, or healthcare, extend that relationship to parents, to carers, have that wraparound support, show that you care, okay? And whilst we're at it, let's get rid of the backstabbing that goes on in the staff room, because I tell you what, if you're backstabbing someone else whilst they're not there, then what are you saying about me? Too dangerous to trust, won't we'll ever win. That barrier is going to remain absolutely triple lock shut. Secondly, predictability and control. As a child returning home to um, ab an abusive home, you do not know what you are walking into. Monsters are not monsters 100% of the time. It's unpredictable. So you're constantly walking on eggshells, not knowing, having to try and guess when is things going to you know, flare up, what's going to happen. So anything that is not predictable or over, over which there is little control triggers a hypervigilant state. You have to be aware. You have to be on the constant lookout as to what's happening. Um, therefore, let's have those policies, procedures. Let's, let's make people aware. Let's make sure that people understand you know, what is going to happen, how it's going to happen, why it's going to happen. And the why is really important. Those... Pathways that should have developed during childhood to the thinking brain haven't developed in the way they should. Therefore, whilst you might assume, oh, well, that's obvious. It's obvious why we do that. No, not necessarily. No, it's not. Let's be clear. And also, let's be person-centred. Are policies appropriate? So is, it, is it appropriate for a school, for example, to send a child out who is showing symptoms of hypervigilance because God only knows what's happening at home, is it appropriate to ring home and give them a detention? Or would it be more appropriate with that child to have a safe space for them to go to? Think about what is appropriate for the person that you are dealing with. And finally, positivity. The narrative of any adverse childhood experience is undoubted, 
undoubtedly negative. It is one of useless, helpless, pathetic. Okay? So you can either choose to confirm that by only ever pointing out the negative. And of course, there's going to be negatives. No one's perfect. Okay? Or you can put that negative into a context um, by also highlighting the positive. So ultimately, what we're talking about is a cultural change. Okay? And you don't change culture through emails and memos. You change them through relationships, one conversation at a time. Thank you.